Hello everyone, it's David here and I would like to take a minute out of the show to talk to you about your testicles. Actually I wouldn't, but I have to, they make me do it. It's my own fault, I agreed to do this, but even so it's still not something that I do with relish. But one thing we do all relish is our testicles. And I think it's fair to say that we've all spent a long time time of our lives with our hands on them be honest you know let, let, let's not kid ourselves here al bundy spoke for all of us when he sat there on his couch and you want them in pretty good shape you want them in good nick and you don't want to be nicking them when you're out there with a razor blade this is a highly sensitive area you can't be just going on there with razor blades and shit you seen the mess i make in my neck oh my god so no no danger what you want to do is get a manscaped kit because they are the number one in the sort of perverted feel of, of ball shaving. They are they're the boys, right? They're the boys for your balls. So so it's I should tell them that they should use that. They they come up with loads of great scripts by the way and I just ignore them because, you know, I I still want to get into heaven and I need to have some sort of defence when I stand there at the pearly gates and they say, You're a ball shaving guy and I'll go, you know, go make a living. Anyway, uh, Christmas is coming, and why not surprise a friend? I know that I, for one, would be taken aback if somebody said to me, especially a male friend, said, there you go, what about your boss? Um, so it would be novel. Great secret Santa gift. You strike me as a man with particularly her suit testicles. Why not take this? So you can get 20% off and free shipping if you use the code RANGERS at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. So be thankful this holiday season because it's the best gift of all from Manscaped. Your balls will thank you. And that's another one done. Wehe! Take care. Bye bye. Good evening, welcome back to Heart and Hand. This is Heart and Hand Extra, your second free show of the week. As always, I am your host, Adam Thornton. Joining me for this evening's show, we have Martin Ramsey. Martin, how are you? I'm not bad, Adam. Good to be here. Good evening, listeners. Just the two of us tonight, Martin. We can uh, make it if we try. There's not a huge <laughs> amount to not a huge amount to get through. To be honest, um, a bit of a turgid one nil win. Um, last night at the time of recording, but we'll chat that through uh, as we go. I wanted to just have a quick high level, um, your thoughts or our thoughts on the uh, accounts that were released uh, earlier in the week. Um, obviously over on Heart and Hand, uh, patreon.com forward slash Heart and Hand, Andy McGowan has done a, a full review on blog posts and I believe daily update, although I've not got around to listening to it yet. So um, if you want to hear more in detail from someone who is more qualified mm. than Martin and myself, you can head over to, to Heart and Hand. Um, Martin, I'll come to you just for some very high-level thoughts from from your point of view. Yeah, we certainly won't get into it in any kind of detail um, like Andy does. Um, well, take out the football in context and the general mood um, around the club, this is good news. Um building towards some kind of better um, self-sustainability and, and um, just more sensible um, stewardship and management and, you know, those um, revenue figures, for example, um, are, are incredible. And only a few years ago um, seemed kind of out of reach, really. Um, so all of that is... Um, is clearly good. Um, quite a few people seem to be quite disappointed that it was good. Um, usually Celtic supporters, but um, maybe not quite so much in this case. Um, so, out of context, um, that, that that is a good sign. You would hope that next year's are um, even better news on, on that front. And we we're going to talk about the football, obviously, when we talk about the manager, I would presume, but it, it probably indicates why um, there is a lot of loyalty at the boardroom level for the manager given um, given what he's brought in um, from a football perspective that's meant that the the, the board or investors the, the, the guys who have um, obviously done so much over the last few years have not had to, to do that personally and I think you can kind of understand that 
Um, it gives a lot more context to a lot of the frustration and anger in that, that final week of August, um, given what still had to be paid for, what still had to be done. Um, and it would have been, obviously, helpful to have a lot of that better communicated at the time to manage those expectations. I think in general, I, my reading of it, and you know, you, you can shoot me down here, Adam, if I'm wrong, but we could have done more in, in that final week. I'm not sure how much more, but we, we could have done more, but it's, it's all about risk. And I'm getting the sense from, from reading Andy's stuff and certainly, certainly any time Andy speaks, um, that the, the club internally has not shed that trauma fully of, of 2012. It is still hanging over. And I think that, that probably does shape our attitude to risk. Um, speaking to Kieran Maguire, who's obviously done the rounds the last couple of days, um, excellent voice and in, in all these these kind of things that... Um, you know, given that, that that Champions League boost, um, I mean, why didn't we go bigger? Um, and simply still like that, this this climate, you know, spending big is very very risky. It's all relative, of course, but you know, there are clubs that are getting sales into real real problems because of that. Um, and it's taken Rangers a long time to get that kind of financial credibility back with the banks, etc. And it would be just a folly to, to to gamble that on signings because you know, we could break down in training, Adam. You know what I mean? Um, and I just think a lot of this, um, uh, I think we're we're going to be haunted by this for, for still some time, I think, in terms of, of really being completely ambitious with um, with the finances and, and, and converting what looks good on paper onto the onto the pitch. And fans, understandably, get frustrated and angry and see spending as a quick fix to everything. That's, that's what we do because we live in the now. Yeah. Um, OK, there's a, there's a lot to, to unpack there, I guess. Legacy wise, I think when you look at the coefficient tables of which uh, revenue wise, I think we're bottom uh, or second bottom, um, along with Victoria Coolson, which obviously we finished bottom of the entire thing, but they were they were second bottom. So in terms of revenue that we're getting, if you tag that to performances, that just about sits sits there uh, in terms of Champions League revenue. Obviously, the big reason for us is that the first. Um, Five years, really, isn't it? The first five mm-hmm. years of the the ten year coefficient for us, we have nothing. Um, we weren't in the league for four of them, and then we have the progress debacle. So, in that sense, I think I don't have the numbers, but it's a good what six or seven million more that Celtic possibly get mm-hmm. a, a season um, from that. So, in that sense, we're playing catch up still, and we will be for another five years. So, I completely get it from that point of view. Um, when you talk about the financial results there and, and the manager, I guess, being given some credit within the boardroom, I think you then have to extend that to Ross Wilson, who is getting equally as much, the, if, the not sales, more, yeah. Yeah. if not more flack than the manager. Um, my feelings on the recruitment are, are well documented on previous shows. Um, I don't think it's the absolute disaster and this man must be sacked immediately that quite a lot of people think, and I've given my reasons for that in, in the past. Um, however... I think we um, were vocal, certainly me and you, um, when we were in qualify for the Champions League that we thought, from a layman's point of view possibly, but given the noises that came out of the EGM, given then finances that have came in, maybe ignoring a little bit of liability, such as I didn't expect £8 million for Sports Direct, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, but I yeah, felt yeah. that I, I felt that roughly we would be at this stage, I think, with these accounts coming out whether it's round about break even or whether it's a six million operating profit before this and before that, I don't really know what the difference is, to be honest. But I felt that we would be round about where it is as a complete gut feel based on nothing. Therefore, my logic when we then got the additional Champions League revenue was the same as yours. And I think I, I tweeted them and said at, at, at that point when the window shut, we don't have enough here for me in terms of players. I would have thought this season of all seasons where we have a little bit more Cash, we're going to lose seven players at the end of this end of this season. Conservative estimates are about one hundred and forty to one hundred and fifty grand's worth of wages a week uh, going out the door. There, um, could we not be pushing the boat out here and bringing in a couple of players to get settled in? Particularly when we see guys like Yilmaz and, uh, to a lesser extent, Matondo coming in and looking like 
it'll probably be next season before we even see yeah. um yeah. consistent contributions for them. Could we not have done that with even one more midfielder or two midfielders this season? Took that risk, like you said. Um we have the Champions League revenue this year, I think, from speaking to, to Andy that potentially this year's accounts will look similar to last year's. However, these will be a bit of an anomaly moving forward. We probably expect mm. to come down a little bit in terms of revenue if we don't qualify for the Champions League every year, if we don't mm. get to the Europa League final every year. So you kind of treat them together as a bit of an anomaly. But I then thought, well, that's a good time to make sure that you're, like you said, taking yeah. the correct risk and loading it there. So I guess that's the frustration for maybe ourselves and maybe fans like us that don't know the intrinsic expenditure income type thing but just had that sort of gut feeling that I mean come on we've made 30 million in the summer could we not just have done one or two more bits of business but there's even just a general tension with all football fans relatively speaking unless you you follow City or Chelsea or whatever um, is between the short and the long term no one wants jam tomorrow um, especially the kind of frustrations um, just generally around the, the, the club at the moment in terms of the, the, the performance on the pitch and this is Rangers so we you need to be winning the title every year. Um, so it, it's hard for fans to, to split the business and the football and operations completely because the business decisions in black and white kind of make sense. No, no kind of make mm-hmm. sense. A lot of them do make sense and it is prudent and it is sensible and we the, the terror of falling into um, those same old traps, the need for the sugar daddy, um, you know they've been very clear that the, the, that that isn't just that's just something that we we, we can't um, uh, yearn for and we can't fall into again. Um, so we, we do need to be operating in a far more sensible way. But that really ties in. I'm not speaking about Rangers here. It really ties in to the Wednesday to Saturday stuff, um, because that's where we live as, as football fans, and it, that that's the tension um, that's that's pretty much under coming around so take August as uh, or that, that least week, uh, last week in August as an example Adam when those prices come out for the for the tickets that we are paying and not seeing anything immediately back for that when we discussed that in depth that was mm-hmm. <laughs> it was a real I think it was a really bad move at the time I still do because it heaped a lot of pressure on the manager and the team got into that first week in September um, it created a Terrible vibe around the place. Um, if my, if expectations could have been managed a lot better, you know who knows. But I I felt that that that, that was not ideal going into a huge week. Um, and it's when the dust settles on the Van Bronckhorst era, I think they'll look at that week in a lot of detail because he, you know, recovering from Parkhead. I'm not sure that happened, and certainly going into Amsterdam. So. Yeah, it's it's managing all that, it's communication, it's everything that we spoke about at the at the start of September that, that I don't think we did well. Um, even though we can understand a lot more of it um into November. Yeah. Uh, I think so. Um two other minor points I think that jumped out at me again again just as a, a layman, um, was not taking out a, a credit facility, a, a loan or anything on New Edmondson House and electing mm. I assume, to, I, don't, I don't necessarily know whether that's paid up front or whether we are paying it ourselves from our own cash flow and instalments or, or whatever. I don't, I don't know how that works, but that to me seems a little bit then at odds. And again, it's this risk-based thing. Why would you not yeah. do that yeah. at favourable terms to free up funds to invest in, in the squad? Um, it kind of all comes back to those those minute decisions. That was one of them. And then one I read uh, this morning from uh, Jordan Campbell in The Athletic was... Um, £39 million in fees spent on the squad since summer 2020. Now, that is a figure that I think needs a little bit of a context, I guess, because I'm assuming, I haven't read it in intrinsic detail, but I'm assuming that that then covers um, it, it'll be things like agent fees, I think, as well, obviously, but it'll also be installments from, from previous yeah. years. Um, the Ryan Kent one, for example, I think was quite small up front, and then we paid X number of um, yeah. installments over his four-year period, so that's not saying that in a two-year period we've spent forty million on transfer fees, and it's basically forty million spent since Fashion Sakala uh, arrived, or or since um, Calvin Bassey arrived the year before. I should say it's a longer term than that. It could be four years. It could even be 
five years, I don't know, going further back, there could be Morelos money within there that over yeah. the course of his contract or, or whatever. We, we don't really know what that is, so it's a bit of a, a bigger figure. But then on the flip side of that, um, if we're saying, could we not go out and get a three or four million pounds midfielder? No one is saying the board has to find three or four million pounds right now, today. They have to find a down payment for that midfielder yeah. and agree to pay in instalments. So I don't think we can use that both, or we need to use that both ways, if that makes yeah. sense. If someone like Andy comes on and says, where are they going to five, find five million for a midfielder? Well, they don't really need to. They need to find a million pounds for five years. But it comes um, back to the risk, so they don't want to be stuck. They don't want to be stuck two or three years down the line when we haven't qualified for the Champions League, probably not in a Europa League final, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that we didn't know that when we, we bought Ryan Kent. So I, I know exactly what you're saying, but I, I just <laughs> the way I read it, where we're not in a position where you just know or you can know as much as you can but what you're bringing in every year and, and, and things have settled we're not in a post 2012 settled position I don't think yet and there's still we are clearly still working to, towards that um, where you can then start to, to properly kind of plan on some kind of sound basis shouldn't be really planning for Champions League money anyway obviously that's what's stung us in the past and many other clubs um, but it's yeah yeah we we just we're not going to go and push the push the boat out um, unnecessarily, um, and I, I I guess to your other point um, about the credit or the lack of credit facility, I presume we were building our credit rating up as, as much as possible, effectively to try and you know um, equate it to the the, the normal household uh, and trying to do everything ourselves uh, until we absolutely need to. To, to use that kind of facility at on or on better terms further down the line. Um, but very conscious that I'm not an expert on these things, but it, it's really, it, it's that, that tension between the, 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 the now and future years, Emerson House being a perfect example of that. Um, and also, I think we're very, very risk averse as a club. And... That's not entirely uh, ridiculous or, or, or difficult to understand. But at some point, those shackles will have to be broken and we'll have to be braver um, about the business as well as on the park. Otherwise, I'm not sure how we convert this recovery from you know nowhere to winning a title, to winning a cup, but maybe only winning that every three years or so to then becoming what someone in my generation would understand Rangers to be, which is consistently winning or at the very least taking it to, to the death. Um, that's going to take a break in mindset. Um, but again, that can only happen when there's a, a security um, there to, to, to do so. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um Absolutely. I think the risk averse part isn't something that anyone is is going to um, have an issue with there. I guess like it's shades of risk, isn't it? It's, it's where we yeah. can speculate to accumulate a little bit that maybe we don't have the full the full picture on. Um, like I said, Andy has mentioned that revenue will probably drop by about 10 million, um, assuming we don't get straight into the Champions League again or assuming we don't get to the Europa League final. So um, in essence, there'll be a 10 million reduc- reduction in what we currently see just now, I think he'd said probably around about 70 to 75 million of revenue would be uh, about right for us. That's obviously maxing out commercial, uh, etc. as well. Um, but then we would hope that there's none of these exceptional uh, payments, etc. Um, Sports Direct and, and whatever else is in the accounts there as well, which should hopefully balance out. Um, regardless of finances, etc. then I guess, Martin, for me, on the pitch, I think we need to be aiming at, I don't know, finger in the air to ready-made first-team players being um, recruited each summer and then maybe one high potential who can come in and be, whether it's a rotation option in the way yeah. that Yilmaz is or, or coming in as as that type of profile player. I think we need to be getting to that position every year. Now, that's not me saying, right, we need £10 million of transfer fees every year because there will be bargains that we pick up, such as uh, your Tom Lawrence's or um, your Cholax coming in for a couple of million. But I think we need to be in a position where we can go out and buy two players that can impact the team uh, and ideally one or two high-profile youngsters there. So I, I guess the big question for us then when that normalises and we get to a point where we're just making a relatively small profit hopefully every year, it needs to be that player trading model that kicks in then to give us that extra 
funding to allow us to go and do some more projects outside of the, the football pitch, absolutely, but then allow us to reinvest back into the team a portion of that as well. I think that's key for where we get to, regardless of the nuts and bolts of this income coming in and this expenditure going out. No, I completely agree. Uh, too many too many peripheral players um, that, are, that are filling up the filling up the squad, filling up the bench, um, coming and going, rotating here, there and everywhere. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think, again, this, we hoped the wee bits of it last summer, I would argue there probably is, given the, play, the players that have came in, other than Matondo, Suther has been injured, but I think most people will know he's, he's going to be a pretty capable um, squad option at centre-back. But I think we've done okay in that, in terms of the players coming in. I don't think there's many um, disagreements or, or big disagreements on the quality of some of those players coming in. It, it's just probably we didn't have enough this summer. It's going to be the same. I, I wouldn't have been surprised if it always was, to be honest. I think we've spoken before about that cycle of, of getting to 55 and getting to that summer, which was the peak, if you like, um, three years in and the manager at the time yeah. and Ross Wilson yeah. making the decision we're not going to sell players and by making that decision you're not going to sell players that sort of means you're then tying your hand behind your back because you might not necessarily want to give them contracts as well or they might not want to sign contracts so that decision being made there is probably the impact of that that we're seeing now in terms of players coming to the end of their, their contracts etc in one big go which we could have managed a little bit better but I, I'm not really sure there are many players leaving in this summer that the vast majority think we absolutely have to keep for their playing abilities. It maybe just be more value and all that sort of stuff. So hopefully by the summer it's a bit of a blank slate in that term and we can get back to that normal football club of you're here for two years, you get a yeah. contract or you get sold. Because even a normal football club that's been that was put in the situation we were and we're rebuilding, etc, etc, and they bring a new manager in, miles behind the champions, the leaders. Um there's probably a, a longer plan yes. in place with a lot more patience and a lot more layers and selling players it's got, earlier. It's got Just, one, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, but it's... at this club, in that situation, we can, I don't care, it was stopping 10. And everything, every penny almost every ounce of direction and effort was 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 put into to get that league championship as quickly as possible um so that isn't layered and it isn't patient and it's thinking about what comes after that i don't think there was a thought given to what came after the 8th of march 2020 to be honest um and then that that summer, it's kind of looking around and saying, right, well, what, what do we do next? Um, and that's, no one was complaining at the time, obviously. So it's churlish to do so now. We are not a normal club. We're not a normal club in a normal situation. And I'm just saying that if it, if you're thinking theoretically about that rebuild, there'd be a lot, a lot more um, considered, cooler, um, cold-hearted, actually, decisions made. Um, about general build, and it'll be a lot more longer term than um, we need to win the league in three seasons, which I think Gerard came under. I think we're all agreed that was that was the plan, um, and we're we're kind of feeling the the, the hangover of that, I, I suppose. And um, yeah, don't be surprised when <laughs> the, those energy levels and motivation levels and, and, and interest levels and, and just ability levels aren't, aren't quite there as, as players just tip over um, that, that peak that you mentioned. Yeah, that, that summer's an interesting one because as you mentioned, it, it was very much what I just said there, I guess. People were thinking we needed two or three quality additions to the team mm. to, to keep it going and, and we were absolutely fine. Um, but when you think about it in terms of, I don't know, put yourself in Ross Wilson's shoes, you've got a manager who has more sway than you at the club, um, yeah. to be honest, at, at that point, I, I would say, given what he had achieved, saying he categorically doesn't want any of his players being sold. Uh, you then turn around and you've got a board saying, oh, well, there's no money to, to bring in more players anyway. Um, so you're almost left between a rock and a hard place there. You can't generate funds to improve the team. Um, and there are no funds left over to improve the team. So that's where I really struggle with that window because not what is he meant to do, I'm sure there's other things to do, but for the, the zero money that we had, bringing in Sakala who contributed 
a number of goals last year. Lundstrom, who I think most people will say is a, a good to very good bit of business, both on frees. Um, I don't think it was enough looking back, absolutely, but I don't think it's a failure in terms of recruitment uh, in that window. We can talk about the next two, um, absolutely, but it's an interesting aspect of it for me that because there, there's there's that blanket this is a failure without actually looking to say what situation were we in not what did the fans think but looking back mm-hmm. now what situation were we in where our hands tied for reasons out with anyone else's control and what we do know is that Gerard asked for more money uh, and it wasn't there and he was also told uh, he also True. said he didn't he didn't want to sell any of his players as well so it, yeah. it's that rock and a hard place situation which I think is interesting to look back on yeah, it's not there, so either generate it yourself by being yeah. Malmo and moving forward, or exactly. um, you're going to have to work with what you've got. I mean, uh, I know you hate this, Adam, but you know me, um, historical parallels and, and, and mentality are, are at the forefront of my memory, but um, I think when you do achieve something remarkable, and, and it was for that, that group of players, most of whom have won nothing to win something that you know is emotionally huge and, and resonant to, to, to your club. Um, you probably do need a quite brutal and ruthless um, change of pace pretty much immediately because you will be dealing with a lot of players who just don't have the, the emotional reserve to go again because they're, they're still floating about. They don't have the hunger. It's not there. They've, they've just done something huge. They're, they're bloated. <laughs> and then that'll come again. But um, the, the we Rangers, um, we, we there is a parallel there, kind of in 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 eighty seven, um, we we just didn't really do that work particularly well, um, in in the market, and it just didn't quite happen, um, and we've maybe got something kind of similar with 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 post Seville as well, um, in dealing with that that flatness, um, and that that excruciating disappointment that you really need a, a wave. Of, of fresh blood and energy. We thought we'd, I think you and I agreed the first wave was there, um, but we, mm-hmm. we didn't quite get the second. I think when you've got that flatness for mentality reasons, etc., like you said, and then there is that staleness with, with the actual squad too, and, and you're not bringing in players again that you mentioned, then I think absolutely there are there are um, issues there, but I, I just think there's it's a, it's a whole complex piece when you look at the funding that was available yeah. in that yeah. summer 21 window um, in January uh, as well. You could argue Aaron Ramsey money could have, again, could have went on a central midfielder. Knowing what we know now, would there have been a central midfielder coming in or would it just have been no one and Aaron Ramsey was just a I was <laughs> say right, place, right, t- right place, right time, but you know what I mean? Just a kind of magpie um, silver thing coming in and we probably wouldn't have brought anyone else in. So, um yeah, I don't know. I think this window for me is the time to judge. Um, and I really think over the piece, um, when we've spent money, and I go back to the start of, of Gerard, when we've spent money, um, we've got it right more often than not. Top of my head, in terms of outright failures, I can think of Eros Gresda. Um, it's right on my head. Eros Gresda, Cedric Eaton, uh, and then... Some people will say it's too early to judge or not, but for two point five million, I think Matondo isn't doing himself huge amounts of favours right now. Um, and then whatever we spent on Aaron Ramsey, um, I, I think when you compare that to players in at the minute, albeit some of them are, are are quite short to judge, I think when we spend money, we're doing okay with it. You would just argue that there's an imbalance, and we're maybe not spending in the right areas at various points, yeah, which again yeah. all comes into it as well. I generally think this season too too soon um, to judge any of them, good or bad. Um, we'll, yeah. we'll just wait and see. With respect to the Ramsey thing, I'm sure this weird FIFA plan was 150 grand a day for for any anyone that plays at the World Cup. That's if you if he's been at your club for the the, the two years previous, something incredible like that. Um, even if they've left, even if they've left, the even club. if they've played in in the last two years, I'm sure. Uh, so something oh. kind of mental like that. So I don't know if that's funding or that was um, in mind with the the Ramsey thing. Um, some may. Uh, point to roof in terms of we knew how injury prone he was and people just get frustrated. I would argue he wins as the league, and that's yep. you're, no you're, doubt about it. You're, you're you're front loading a lot of that investment for that that quick instant hit that that, that he gave us. Um, um, some might point to Hollander as well. Um, mm-hmm. it has has that kind of worked out? Um, but again. <laughs> No film, no party, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of um, yeah. defensive solidity. So, um, 
uh, and, and no title. So um, it's, it's it's football fans. And, and when it comes to judging the value of transfers, you know, you, you'll get varying opinions on Cholak at the moment that you, you wouldn't have got, you know, a week past Saturday when he, he, he rattles that one against Aberdeen. We will change our minds uh, on a almost weekly basis. So um, that that's just that's just the nature of it. Um, ultimately, though, from the manager to the boardroom um, to the subs bench, um, everyone will be Judge Wilson included on, on what silverware comes through the door. Yeah, Riff's a funny one because, again, the longer it goes then the more likely he is to, to be deemed as, as a waste of money. But I think you nailed it spot on from from that 2-0 win at Parkhead in, what was that, mid-October 2020 until that mm. last gasp, Motherwell one just after, just before Christmas, just after Christmas. That stretch won as a league. Um, and, and Kamal Roof had, I don't know, 11 goals in 10 games and finished that league that season as top goal scorer. So you have to ask yourself, would you paid £3 yeah. million, £4 million yeah. pounds to win that league? Yes, I would. Thank you very much. So... Um, <laughs> Where can we get that down. again, please? Yeah, can we do that now? Um, yeah, so I, I might not look at the full thing, but no one has been. No one was looking at the full thing at that point. It was just that one single aim of let's go and win that league. So for me, he was one of the most important parts of it um, in that period, as I mentioned, where we pulled away, we sealed it. Uh, I would say at Park, uh, Ibrox on the second of January, um, and then Morelos came in and got us some some good wins. Hibs away, Aberdeen away, all that sort of stuff. But the bulk of that work was done um, in that period, pretty much from now onwards to Christmas uh, two years ago. Okay, 29 minutes in. And if we have to, we're going to talk about Rangers 1, Hearts uh, 0 last night. Um, first half was not great, Martin. All these buzzwords that, that we hear about looking for a reaction, the same players going again, minimal changes, um wanting to rectify their mistakes, all that sort of stuff. I don't think we got much of it. Um, we've been talking for a while about showing more intensity and showing more tempo. Um, the first half an hour against St. Johnson um, and then bits of that first half last night, absolutely intensity and tempo were, were up. However, we are still, to my mind, getting absolutely killed by our quality in the final third, whether it's a final pass, whether it's a poor um, a final pass, just a, a poor moment of judgement, being caught unaware from trying to counter-press, taking a shot from a ridiculous angle. Um, we are doing okay getting the ball into that final third and getting the ball into good locations in front of the goals, but we're not clinical and we can't get that pass off and it is causing so many issues. We could have been 1-0 one nil, one nil up in the first minute or two. I think that was the best chance of the half for us mm. um, where Kent gets that ball and we kind of pull it back and it just misses this person, it just misses that person. It wasn't a great first half at all, I didn't think. Um, but like I said, there are points in there where you think we're not far off and then you start to get a little bit of hope but then you remember that these have been things that have been happening for the best part of this calendar year domestically in terms of being clinical and getting into good positions, um, it just kind of felt like the same again. Yeah, I mean, I'm very conscious this is more your area expertise than mine, but I'll give it a bash anyway. I, I agree. I think we have no issues really getting the ball into that final third. Uh, I'll, that that first 20 minutes, half an hour on, on Sunday, I agree. Um, I thought well, that, that midfield three looked um, to be working quite well. It, it was playing at a good pace. It was, it was knocking it about. My issue is that especially the two wider men in the front three, they get it at a standing start too often, um, or or quite stationary anyway. Uh, and by the time there's any kind of momentum there, their their, their space is limited, and then it's back to Bonner, it's back to Tav, and it's a deeper in swinging, um, oh sorry, out swinging cross, um, and that's that's absolute food and drink, um, to. Scottish football teams. Um, I can't really remember Rangers consistently or Ken or Matondo or Sakala or Wright or whomever uh, are in those positions or an overlapping fullback getting to the actual byline with the simple cutback. Um, now, a ridiculous comparison, but 
you know, the, the, the best teams in Manchester City being probably that, that, that example of scoring easy goals because a lot of the hard work, moving players around, getting in behind. So it's just simple cutbacks to, um, you know, to, to lead to simple finishes. There was a hint of that in the goal last night. It wasn't mm-hmm. quite a cutback, but it it wasn't just a, a hopeful cross. It was something um, different, it, though. Yeah. It was a it, it was just players receiving the ball on the run. The movement of the front three is just appalling, generally, and that got a bit better in the second half. Got a bit more chaotic. You come to Morelos in a minute. That doesn't necessarily mean better quality, but that that would be my my issue. You and I have spoken this week, and that I'm not sure we agree, but I do think there's a greater risk reward in playing through the middle of teams um, mainly because if if you swing it across, my reading of it is if that's headed clear A, you have a chance to win the second ball potentially, and B, they don't have it under control yet whereas if there's a, a movement, whether it's a dribble, whether it's a, a, you know just slipped passes and in, in, in through, if that goes wrong and it's intercepted, well the team has more instant control it's on the deck and then they can spring they can get that, that turnover a lot under control a lot quicker so it has its own risk which plays in to just about every conversation we have about rangers at the moment whether it's on the pitch whether it's in the boardroom whatever it may be and that that is our our comfort with risk because the Mm -hmm. pressure is unbearable it is at this club at the best of times um and we have seen great stuff from these players even some of the new players um, it wouldn't surprise me if we go to the end of the season and we still have some super moments. Obviously, not going to come in Europe this season, but but in a cup or or, or whatever. Um, they are capable of moments. They're not capable of consistency. We know that. Um, but it's just we don't see it enough, and I, I think it 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 has to be because they they are they want to pass that buck far too often and have someone else do it. And I think it's endemic in just about everything. We we are we are generally just not yet comfortable as a structure, as a club with risk. We're not comfortable um, being winners. We're not comfortable being or see, seeing ourselves as natural champions yet. People talk about Celtic's you know, complete change over last year and a lot of players out, a lot of new players in and yeah, there's a lot of new players there that haven't won much in the, the same way that, that, that we have a lot of uh, guys in the dressing room who hadn't but structurally, there are expectations at that club because they have dominated Scottish football for 20 years. It's endemic. It's in the fibre of everything. And therefore, you, there's just an assumption that you, you, you will do this and you will do that. You can have a bad season, of course, as they did, and hopefully will again at some point. Um, but I don't think I see Rangers yet in that, that fashion. Because it comes from evidence. It comes from doing it and doing it again and doing it again and building up just that that complete um, institutional confidence. And I think it manifests itself quite a lot. And, and, and that, for me, on the part last night, in the first half, a lot better in the second, I think. Couldn't be much worse. But it's happened far too often. Um, is that Look at the corners, Adam. I mean, you, you, you explained to me I would, I would think, in my my view, one of the most dangerous balls, maybe not from a corner, maybe more from a, a free kick on the side of the box. Surely, one of the most dangerous balls in football is a, a proper in swinging delivery, and we yes. never vary it. We never want to try anything different. We hardly wanted to do that last year. I mean, that that second goal against Red Star at home came from doing something different with a corner. I think we hardly saw it again. There was two and in that, that game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so. And yeah, we can talk about the manager briefly, I guess. Uh, I, I can see that as well. Um, very rigid, hanging to what we what we know. Um, or it's complete throwing shit at the wall. There just doesn't seem to be that that kind of um, happy medium there. Uh, that, and last night was a perfect example of that. It was so terrified, um, jittery. Um, lack in invention. We talk about lack in invention. We talk about lack of guile and creativity. That takes risk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't send a beautiful pass through without it being difficult um, to do, um, and having to do something special to to, to beat a defence. That that means risk. And I don't know how you felt, Ibrox, last night being over in in the gantry, but 
it didn't feel like booze were, were very far away, and I mean from five minutes. I mean from that first Hearts counter. And it, listen, it cannot be easy for any professional footballer to to play the numbers, to try and be risky in that kind of environment. So it's, it's a kind of self-defeating thing. Yeah. A um, couple of things there. Do, do the tactical bit first, I guess, just to get out of the way. Um, in terms of the risk award, I think you're spot on. Uh, what I would say is if you, absolutely, if you're John Lundstrom, for example, when you've got the ball at the edge of the box, the risky, the least risky thing to do is to pass the ball to James Tavernier and have him cross it in because, like yeah. you said, it's going to be a header away. We have an, we'll have an opportunity to counter press. Um, if not, then fair enough, we've got men behind the ball potentially. But if he then makes a pass which is um, lost, the defender comes past him and, and can break away. Yes, there's risk there. What I would say is behind that, then um, our centre halves should be a match for any attacker in the league, 1v1 uh, outside of Celtic, so that's where that risk comes in, I'm fine because he's behind me and he can dominate anybody on, on the ball, win the ball back, the same way that more often than not we went Goldson and Balogun, mm-hmm. um, man v man uh, for large parts of that that 55 season, nothing's going to get past them, they're going to deal with that you could argue maybe we don't have that same security behind with um, Davies and King or Davies and Sand or King and Sand because things have changed so much so yes there'll be an element of risk aversion probably there as well but we've not done it for ages we've always done this we've always reverted to the side by side stuff so clearly there's something in there that thinks we we want to score goals and we want to be taking risks but we're going to try and choose the least risky way to do it which doesn't really sit with me Um, the corners get very very weird Um, particularly I think an outswing a corner for me is particularly useful when you've got lots and lots of tall players because they can then they can jump onto it they can get the leap on their man and it's um, goals. We've seen how many goals have we seen? Again, Balogun, Goldson, um, even Aribo at the front post come and that's an in-swinging corner that comes in and he sort of flicks it. Yeah, but Out-swinging that. corner that comes in so he flicks it coming in. That, that isn't happening anymore, but I, I don't understand. I don't understand why they go out and say, let's just keep doing this because it isn't working at all. Even just Barisic going to the other side and Tavernier going to the other side and put the same kind of ball in but hang on top of the goalkeeper so that something can happen closer to the goal. Um, it's these things that we never understand and no one will, will come out and say um, they won't ask and, and they won't be those questions won't be answered in press conferences um, so I, I find that I find that challenging um, and it goes back to that sort of point about everyone's looking for someone to blame um, and it comes down to um, I guess what you value the most. Lots of people will value a manager who shouts and screams on the touchline and gets players fired up and gets a reaction from players um, and that's great. They'll then think that's a really good manager he can motivate, he can do this and he can do that. Van Bronckhorst is never going to be that type of guy, I, I don't no. think, in terms of shouting and shouting and screaming. Um, so it then needs to come from methodology, uh, I think for me um, and like we said, if we're if we're leaving it up to individuals in the final third to figure things out and they are consistently doing what they did um, against St Johnson, against Livingston and for the first half certainly against um, Hearts then there's a failing there I think on the player side first of all for, for not being clinical and we've seen a body of evidence stretching back over mm-hmm. three or four years there for them but then I think there's potentially a failing on the management side as well because we've had these players for um, the best part of a year we're sending them out to do something they're either not doing what you want them to do or you're not getting whatever your messages are across or the players aren't capable of, of dealing with that um, so there's a lot of complex things in there so um, I'm not sure there's one side that's completely to blame we probably have more evidence to suggest that the players um, can't be trusted to be consistent when trying to break down teams um, but I'm not sure there's huge amounts of evidence to show that, that the manager um, has really unlocked that yet um, the great hope seems to be we'll get to this break, we'll get a bit of rest and recuperation, and we'll get working on it when we come back yeah. after uh, after the winter. But I'm not sure how realistic we've heard that, that is. We've, we've heard it. We've heard it before in the summer, and um, and I know you weren't a fan of uh, the initial uh, period of games that, that, that Van Bronckhorst took over um, uh, immediately. Um, 
in terms of the, you know the quality but I, I was a big fan of the, the old results then um because it was a horrible period of the game for someone who to, to be thrown in um and he, he i thought he, he managed it superbly well we all hoped that that winter break would see a bit more of his stamp um we all hoped the summer would see similar um so i don't have a lot of faith that this winter break is 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 going to deliver that when the the, the the previous two um, hiatuses have, have, have not. Um, he, he said something there about screaming and balling. So I, I don't want that either. I know there's, there are a lot of Rangers fans and a lot of football fans who, who do want to see that on the touchline. I personally don't really think it's that, that relevant. Um, however, I'm sorry to keep coming back to, 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 to the wrist thing, but it does create pressure. Rangers are a difficult club to play for. Um that title's gone. It feels a long time ago now. Um, so the pressure on to, to deliver something else um, with all these expectations and, and you know, club not quite, as I said, being absolutely back. So how do you take risks? How do you empower people to take risks? Well, I know it's another word you hate, Adam, but you need leaders. You need someone to show responsibility and show example. I don't think we have that in the park. I don't really think we have that in the dugout. I don't think we have that in the boardroom necessarily um, figures that Rangers players, fans uh, everyone involved can rally round and be led and empowered to try something whether that's as I said off the pitch, whether it's on the pitch um, you need those people, can't rely on just one but you need those people who do take risks who do show that it's okay to do that and see if it doesn't come off, I've got your back don't care about the bedlam, don't care about the booze, don't care about the, the, the noise out there. Here's what I want. And again, that can be on the pitch in the dugout, upstairs. Here's what I want, and I'll do it. You can follow. And don't worry, I've got I've got you. I guess I I guess I struggle with that a little bit. And maybe it's a modern fan opinion because we talk about those type of players and it's it's very subjective in terms of leadership. Um to me the type of players that we describe are ones that are probably universally loved by the support. I would say you have to go maybe as far back as Brian Lowrup to find someone that's universally loved by the, the support at all times. So that's what I kind of struggle with that, having a fan base he collectively wasn't. saying... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you know what I mean? When you look back, nobody's got a bad word to say. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, having a fan base collectively say we're OK because we've got these two or three players in the team that are going to drag us through things... We've had those players in the team for the last three or four years and they've been absolutely hammered from pillar to post as soon as uh, a result comes in. So I'm, uh, that's where I struggle with the leadership thing. If someone wants to, to bring out Richard Goff and Carnet that can play as a, a modern centre-half or um, Stuart McCall or, or Ian Ferguson... Or I, I, I don't Browns. even mean they're running about, Adam. I, I just, for me, bravery, talking about purely, purely football, bravery's on the ball. Yes. And trying things. Um ultimately come from a manager. You see new manager bounces, like proper ones that actually last. And you say, how oh, these these players were garbage? And now all of a sudden they're trying things. Where does that come from? It comes from actual leadership that empowers risk-taking, that empowers creativity. Same players that were terrified, stodgy, couldn't care, whatever. That's where the intangibles come, it's not someone shouting and bawling it's not someone with blood dripping from their head um, and I'm not even talking about the, the crowd getting behind someone it's, it, that, we don't count really, it's the players <laughs> it's the players saying well he's doing that, I can do that it's it's a le- who's, who's the king of Ibrox mm-hmm. who's, who's, who is making everyone around them feel 10 foot tall in any and department had, we've not had enough of that on and off like you said absolutely not yeah. there's not been enough of that um, and it's what we struggle with it's interesting you mentioned the the um, this time last year grinding out those wins um, the manager used a, a phrase he's not used in a while last night in the, the post-match press conference that he was mm. pleased to keep the, z- keep the zero um, I think that uh, is absolutely fair I think Stevie might have mentioned uh, whether it was on the post match or, or certainly after the game, that was King and King and Davies' first clean sheet together, which I guess speaks volumes 
um, for how things have been going recently. Um, I've seen a little bit today on on Twitter, and I don't. If people want to grasp for optimism uh, and positivity, etc., that's fine. And we'll talk about the second half here. I, I think it's fine to say we looked a little bit better in the second half um, than we maybe have done, while also saying we couldn't possibly have, have looked any worse. And yeah. I don't want that to be a sort of backhanded criticism type thing, but I haven't seen many people pointing to the second half and saying, oh, well, that's a, that, that, that will stand us in good stead for, for going forward. I have seen a few things about Omarillo should 100% start at, at the weekend and things which people are entitled to. People will always be magnetised to Alfredo Morelos for whatever reason if he decides to show interest for 10 or 15 minutes uh, in a game. everyone, Some people will certainly come and say, oh, he should be playing. What a guy. Love him. It's absolutely fine. People are more than welcome to, to their opinions on it. Um, but I think what we want to be careful is obviously saying just because people said that was a little bit better, they're not saying everything is rosy again now and, and everything is great in the garden and we're going to forget everything. I think sometimes when a result happens, we look at the result and we think, thank God, that was great. And then you'll look back at it and you think, well, that missed chance actually wasn't that bad, was it? Or, or oh, he tried something there and it never came off. The only reason you're kind of given that benefit of the doubt is because we won the game. You're, you're looking back on it. You're looking back on it without the fear. So I think we probably need to be careful. I don't think anybody came out of there thinking Rangers are back, this is fantastic, Scott Wright's firing all cylinders, Morelos looked great when he came on, Ryan Kent had a had a good second half and thinking that's us sorted. Um, but being fair about it all, the second half was a little bit better, Ryan Kent looked a bit better, they tried something slightly different, a different kind of pass, Draw, drawing players in for the goal, giving it to Barris, as you mentioned, it wasn't quite a cutback, but it, it kind of was, it was a bit of variance that he wasn't doing in the first half. He was just hammering balls in. So was Tavernier to, to no one in the box. But then we started to get on that left-hand side something a little bit different through the players that were already there. And on the right-hand side through brand new players in the shape of um, Alfredo, Scott Arfield and uh, Scott Wright coming on and just giving us a little bit of freshness and a little bit of different ways to attack on that side. It did look a little bit better, didn't it? It did look better. Uh, couldn't look worse, response, um, everything everyone said, um, where that came from, I don't know why that that why it doesn't manifest itself enough in that, that first 45, I don't know. Um, but it's, it's a glimpse into what's what's kind of possible. Uh, the Morelos thing, yeah, I think we've, we've talked this to death, Alfie needs to play every minute of every game, or I'm not sure what he's for, because he is not Mentally and physically, I don't think he is the kind of player you can rely on to come in um, and just do this, do that. And because you've got your, your penalty box predator in Cholak, which solves problems that we had last season, I think it creates another, because we don't know what to do with Morelos. And that's, um, we've been here before, he needs like three or four games of that, looking a bit rusty, and then gets in a groove, then gets in a rhythm, then looks like the player that we, we've all known. Um, but unless he plays everything, I I not sure really what he what he brings and it's a it's a real conundrum. It absolutely is. Um conscious of time, I just want to mention Malik Tillman. Um great goal. Um there were points I thought he looked really, really good. There was other points I thought he was he was really slack. In terms of his his, his style, he looks very, very languid, Martin. However, I was speaking to Joshua Barry earlier on today and in terms of his work off the ball, in terms of the stats and all that sort of stuff, he is performing really well in that sense. Um, so maybe that laziness, if you like, that we see sometimes where he isn't making the run or, or he's maybe playing a pass that we don't think. Um, it's maybe more uh, that he is doing some good things. We just sit, tend to highlight the negatives just very quickly before we finish up. What were your thoughts on him? I think you're right. Um, we are, we're bad as fans to see that um, that front cover and he, you know, the, the Mikhail Chenko thing. Um, and he, he probably does, but... It, when you have that that image and your that perception rooted in your mind, when he doesn't do something, at which he, he is known for, and we have seen him um, just you know watch players, Ajax was was a pretty um, bad example for that, and um, just just watch runners go off him. Um, that's what sticks, and that that's a perception thing. That's a fan thing. Um, the numbers probably are a lot better than than our eyes tell us, but it's a frustration because. He's physical. He's a big lad. He walked in the press mm-hmm. room after Aberdeen. I was like, Jesus. Um, I don't think he uses that enough. And he's clearly talented. Um, but he's young. And 
it, yeah. again, it's this, this balance thing. Maybe a bit similar to Ryan Kent, I think, in terms of belief, confidence, personality, whatever you want to call it. Um, not necessarily on the football pitch itself, but maybe off it. They're maybe a little bit shy and all that sort of stuff, which I think has an impact. Anyway, OK, so 1-0 win. Uh, this stage, that's the most important thing. On to St Mirren on Saturday. Um, Martin, thank you very much for joining me. Oh, pleasure, mate. Thank you. No problem at all. Thank you all for listening. Like I said, hopefully we get a win on Saturday to send us into the, the World Cup break. Uh, David will be back next week to recap that anyway. Um, and outside of that, I hope you all have a lovely weekend. Thanks for listening. We're delighted to have partnered with NordVPN again for this season. We partnered with them last year and they are, of course, a supporter of Rangers FC as an official sponsor there. And best of all, we can give you an exclusive NordVPN deal. If you go to nordvpn.com forward slash heart and hand, you will get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan and one additional month for free, completely risk free. There's a 30 day money back guarantee with Nord. And look, I use this product. I would highly recommend it. I used to work in web, so I know how easy it is to steal people's data, especially if you're using a, a, a Wi-Fi system that, that is a shared one or you're using uh, 4 or 5G, then your details can be out there. With NordVPN, they're absolutely not. And there are other advantages to it as well. Um, you can watch sporting events that maybe aren't being shown in your region. Um, you can purchase flights from different virtual locations, and they do make your flights cheaper. This is very, very useful. What a price is in the UK isn't the same as what a price is in America or a price is on the continent. Um, NordVPN can save you money. Um, you can buy purchasing subscriptions from other countries at a cheaper price uh, and you protect your data while travelling and using public Wi-Fi. I keep coming back to that. Anyone who's at the hassle of a cancelled card will know what I'm talking about. So all you need to do is go to nordvpn.com forward slash heart and hand and you'll get a huge discount off your plan and one month additional free completely risk-free. I urge you to do it.